Good afternoon, everyone who's joining us here for our weekly soul series, Year of the Ecological Garden. My name is Astrid Mushala. I'm on the board of Soul, and I have been an ecological garden designer for many, many years. And we host a presenter every week uh, to speak on the theme of the month, which happens to be trees in urban settings. And we're fortunate to have Chris Morrison, uh, forester and with stormwater forestry in the GTA of Ontario uh, to launch this series of trees in the urban environment. And he's gonna do four parts for us. Today is part one. We're recording this and um, you'll be able to uh, ask questions of Chris afterwards as this is um, a second take. We had technical difficulties on our first one. Anyhow, really happy to have Chris. I'd like to say first that I'm coming to you from Wolf Island, Kingston area, where I'm on unceded territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. And we are thankful to our supporters who help make this series possible, particularly Gaia College, <clears throat> who's given us uh, tremendous support to do the work that we do. And this series is all about sharing uh, expertise and knowledge and concerns that we're facing working uh, ecologically on the landscape, whether it's small scale, large scale. Uh, Chris has worked with um, urban development for many, many, many years. So he's gonna bring another perspective. And this is where we can learn. You don't have to be a sole member, but we certainly appreciate memberships. We have a public membership and a professional membership. Uh, please check us out online. There's lots of resources, but without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Chris Morrison. Welcome, Chris. It's always really great to see you and, and chat with you and uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Oh, great. Thank you, Astrid. Um, yeah, I think hello to everybody that's, uh, that's watching this and uh, I appreciate the, the people that attended the original uh, take, which didn't go so well um, because I was doing it from a fairly rural setting. Um, I'm hopefully in a better spot here uh, to do this. Uh, I live uh, north of Fergus, between Fergus and Arthur in Ontario. Uh, most people might know where Guelph is, sort of, so it's a little ways above there. Uh, and I'm also in uh, the unceded territor territory of the Haudenosaunee uh, peoples here, and uh, <clears throat> which is off the Grand River. It's part of a, a treaty that goes back. It's quite a, interesting if anybody has the time uh, to look at that. Uh, anyhow, um, as Astrid said, this is kind of a four part series. It's a lot of ground to cover. Um, and it's broken up into basically the history of what I call living green infrastructure and development. Basically, it gives the context to our particularly urban sites, uh, how we got here and how our landscape management practices um, uh, can be adapted to dealing with uh, these sites, some of them more extreme, and we'll get into that. Uh, some work well, some not so much. Part two will be the long-term maintenance of living green infrastructure. We get into the more details of that, not from a historic perspective, but uh, from uh, moving forward. Uh, part three will be um, tree selection and planting and construction considerations, uh, <clears throat> which is very interesting. We have a lot of challenges in selecting plant material or actually accessing it. And then we have uh, significant uh, challenges in the quality of the plant material and actually having it survive in uh, urban settings. And then the final uh, part will be how trees grow and the implications of uh, pruning and other uh, tree care practices. And all of these things are focused on what is actually beneficial and what isn't. And I often bring this back, having been in the industry for a long time to uh, accepted income streams uh, versus what's actually uh, beneficial. And 
Anyhow, we'll, we'll move ahead uh, with the first part here, history of living green infrastructure. Um, I rarely do a presentation without doing this. Okay. Uh, just a, a very simple definition because green infrastructure, the definition now involves uh, a fair number of soft and hard landscape features. I love this very old definition uh, from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agencies, and it basically says green infrastructure uses vegetation, soils, and natural processes to manage water and create healthier uh, urban environments. So I really like that because that's uh, where, where I'm focused. And so we're talking about vegetation, so we're talking about our tree canopy, our soils, and specifically natural processes. So you can see uh, under examples of green infrastructure, and this is just uh, almost a short list. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, mechanical uh, features and processes and uh, soft landscape features. So we're gonna focus on not uh, soak away pits and rain gardens per se, even though they are kind of living green infrastructure, but we're gonna focus on the urban tree canopy specifically, but it doesn't exist unto itself. So we'll be talking uh, trees in the context of uh, the living green space. So now I refer to what we talk about as living green infrastructure. So this is a little bit of a Ontario context. It likely resonates with uh, many of the other provinces. So I'm sorry, I just, this is uh, where my area of knowledge lies. <laughs> uh, and uh, we've forgotten uh, that this is the reality uh, just a little over a hundred years ago in many parts of Southern and even mid Northern Ontario. <clears throat> Uh, that's actually Edmund Zavitz. If anybody knows who he is, he's considered the father of reforestation and uh, conservation in Ontario. So when the colonizers, uh, which is the term we use now, um, came uh, to our environment, this is what they saw. So 300 years ago, 1700s, let's say, uh, there was a very stable environment. Uh, with lots of redundancy built in and very uh, a very high level of resilience. It had been this way, uh, it had taken 10,000 years uh, to get to this point. And in a very short time from uh, late 1700s, mostly through the 1800s and then into uh, early 1900s, we deforested. Now, this is an interesting uh, thing because this is almost as if it didn't happen. You have to excuse the phone. I can't stop that behind me there. <clears throat> so we deforested and as a consequence lost all the topsoil as well as the vegetative co co cover and we experienced enormous droughts, uh, floods, uh, erosion, uh, horrific fires that actually took out uh, communities, some of them two or three times with enormous death tolls. Uh, and the abandonment, 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 pardon me, of uh, actually whole communities because they were no longer viable. So through reforestation and uh, improved farming practices, uh, we were able to restore uh, some of the things that the natural environment had provided to us for many years. So there was a reduction in droughts and flooding and the economy returned. Now I like to make this point is we're not back to where we were 300 years ago. So this landscape, as I say, is still in recovery. We're not there, but it's a big improvement. So I'd like to spend a moment or two on this slide. There's a lot going on uh, in this slide, uh, but I'll try and, and make it short. And if anybody's interested, we can come back to this. So basically, this is an Elaine Ingham slide. Uh, many of you will recognize it. And it basically shows uh, the development of soil and vegetation since the, lice, the last ice age, which was about uh, roughly 10,000 years ago. <clears throat> so when the ice sheet retreated, uh, basically we had mostly barren soil, largely rock. And over time, 
the areas to the south and the west, now this is again an Ontario perspective because this didn't happen uh, in the west of Canada uh, to the same extent anyways. Uh, over time, uh, the flora and fauna started populating these areas. Now this early area over here is very simple. It was cyanobacteria and very simple organisms that started to develop, but they left organic matter, which started to develop uh, uh, a very uh, rudimentary soil biology under this. And over time, uh, the above ground and the below ground uh, ecology started to develop. So let's say uh, we get to 5,000 years ago, and I don't know if that's uh, true, but let's say anecdotally, uh, we get into a situation where we're starting to have reasonable vegetative cover and we're having a far more complex uh, soil biology. Now, the interesting thing about this, and down here you can see there's a lot of numbers, but I wouldn't worry about them. Uh, there's something here we call fungal to bacteria ratio. And in the early years, the early succession years, our soil was dominated by bacteria. It was uh, largely uh, anaerobic, so low oxygen, and uh, <clears throat> it supported plants. And we have plants today that we can plant back in uh, this kind of uh, soil uh, biology uh, that do well. But over time, as we get into what our, our settlers or colonizers saw, was these forests. So these uh, mixed forests and conifer forests, the soil biology changed quite significantly to a more uh, fungal uh, biased biology by weight. Still bacteria was important, but largely fungus. Now, the reason I say this, and I wanna get lost in the details is, Back here, the nutrient cycling that was available for plants was very specific. Up here, it developed into another uh, more complex uh, system uh, where different nutrients uh, cycled. What happened in deforestation is when we remove this vegetative cover, uh, we lost a lot of that soil biology and it shifted back here in time. So. Uh, after deforestation and through uh, agriculture and now into uh, urbanization, the reality is we live in the soils that are back here. So for instance, these soils uh, produce uh, nitrates as the main form of uh, nitrogen. These soils up here in our uh, tree covered areas uh, produce ammonium uh, through uh, fungus. Bacteria does uh, nitrates, uh, fungus does uh, ammonium. And what's happening now is in the urban environment is now we're trying to replicate this beautiful canopy cover here of our woody plants. And, and I'm specifically talking about woody plants, so shrubs and trees, because again, the earlier succession plants can do well in the urban setting. But we're asking these plants up here to live somewhere back here in the middle of time. And that's a real challenge. So we really have to focus on uh, our urban environment and try and provide our native uh, kind of climax community plants with everything they need. And that's a challenge on an urban site. So that's a lot on this one slide, but we can come back to that if anybody wants. Uh, I just find it a very succinct point of view that's often missed. Uh, from the point of view of if it grew here in time and space 300 years ago, it's going to do well uh, again. We need to support our, our native plants to a far greater degree if that's our intent. Okay, so back to today, um, <clears throat> we're experiencing a lot of changes. So we're back into the droughts, we're back into the floods and the fires and the erosion, erratic weather, uh, reduced water quality, uh, infrastructure failures, and of course, it's kind of uh, the perfect storm uh, of uh, climate change and urbanization. Uh, though urbanization uh, really has a, a, a unique and significant impact on local climate as well. So we, I'd like to call urbanization the new deforestation from the, the effect that it has on our environment. This is from uh, 
uh, Agriculture Canada, I'm thinking. Anyhow, a soil uh, organic carbon content change. Uh, and this is just a snapshot. You can get this right across Canada. And the interesting thing, and again, forgive me, this is focused on Southern Ontario, but if you see the legend uh, at the bottom, this is uh, soil carbon content change over time. And this is in the last 40 years. So uh, green means uh, we're actually increasing uh, soil carbon. Uh, and as you go down to the, the yellow and the red, uh, these are significant decreases. So, oops, pardon me. So you can see in Southern Ontario, we have significant loss of soil organic carbon uh, and basically the whole area. Now, the interesting thing, if I had that whole map, you would see the prairie provinces down in this green zone uh, where they're actually increasing uh, soil carbon in this soil. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, that uh, the prairie provinces are, are doing much better than we are in uh, highly urbanized uh, developed areas. Okay, so a little history about how development happens and, and now that your area has been uh, reforested or farmed or whatever, we decide to build buildings. So on the left, this is a small community, one I, I live in. This street was built about 125 years ago. At the time, they didn't have the ability to move a lot of soil or subsoil any distance. So when they dug a foundation or put a street in, everything got utilized basically very close uh, to site. Uh, or moved a little bit uh, distance uh, away. And sure, the good topsoil and the subsoil all got mixed up or whatnot, but it left a really nice pervious uh, environment uh, with good, reasonable soil biology. So you go into the old parts of town, most towns, almost anywhere, and you'll see these magnificent trees. People can grow good gardens. They might have some shade issues maybe uh, with this. But uh, this is kind of the beauty of the small downtown core of uh, <clears throat> uh, particularly small communities, maybe not so much a uh, big uh, metro center. Um, so over time, uh, this is the way we develop now, and this is the reality. We have uh, masquerading and master plan communities. It's done very differently. So on the left, what we would do today, if we had this street, is we would draw a line right across the center here, just uh, as an example, and we would cut off the whole top of this area and we would dump it down here. So we could level it up completely. It makes it very uh, more friendly for putting in your sewers and water mains and general hard infrastructure. We couldn't do that back then, but we can now. And so this is what we have over here on the right. So post-World War II, uh, we had a lot of technology coming back from the war, tracked vehicles and uh, powerful diesel engines, and it allowed us to really alter the landscape significantly. And uh, part of the procedure was to uh, compact everything uh, so it could support a, a structure, whether we needed to compact it or not, that's just what we did. Again, this little picture of a topsoil pile uh, this is mostly anaerobic, dead, biologically soil. The top 30 centimeters or so is biologically active, uh, but stressed. And what do we get growing on there? You don't see any natives growing up there. These are all wheat. So uh, early successional plants that are growing here. So this is typical. A lot of people, unless they're moving into a new home, they, they have ordered and bought. They probably didn't see this go on before uh, they moved in. Uh, this is common. Uh, and again, this site will be a graded topsoil added and the finished lands landscape expected to perform as a natural and pervious site. Those ruts there are 30 inches deep. So they're working the soil just after uh, spring thaw. We do construction seven or uh, 12 months of the year these days. So this is the same neighborhood, and this is what's in the lawns and the boulevards. It's compacted fill, a gravel, which is your regular driveway gravel. 
uh, screenings, uh, concrete washout, anaerobic topsoil, one, maybe 2% organic matter and super high compaction levels uh, that basically approach uh, what's in a brick. Uh, so in, in reality, despite uh, specifications, this is often your topsoil specification uh, it, that uh, we live with here. And if you were to put in a penetrometer or compaction uh, probe into that ground uh, on this site, you'd be lucky to get an inch. So planting, what is the correct treat for the site, the correct planting procedure? The truth is often there's no tree suitable for many sites. So we see these little boulevard trees planted here. So what will the contribution of these trees be in 40 years? Because in order to maximize the benefits of them, we need them to grow uh, to maturity. So these trees are actually 40 years old. Uh, they've caused extensive infrastructure damage and received significant injury and will decline and be removed. Uh, what this is, it's just a simple sidewalk replacement. These trees, because of the high compaction, low organic matter of the boulevard, have surface root, rooted and have lifted the sidewalks in the whole neighborhood. They came along, excavated out the old sidewalk and replace it what you see at the base of these trees is actually the root injury that was removed uh, from this excavation this is every tree on the street so these trees will decline uh, they'll have the dead root uh, pruned out of them uh, at an expense out of the urban forest budget uh, ultimately they will be removed the stumps will be ground out and we'll go ahead and replant exactly in the same site. So I like this little thing, 143 days without addressing the real problem. <clears throat> so we know they get the benefits out of trees, they have to reach maturity. And we know at planting time, you can see the red line, we have very high costs in planting a tree. And they stabilize over time. And if the urban forest is well maintained, uh, it's fairly stable. It's only when the tree seriously senesces at the end where you get into a lot of decay and, uh, and the need for pruning that it drops significantly. But if you look at where our tree benefits come, they're a little ways out, you know, they're not happening. Uh, here it's showing, you know, the crossing point is maybe 15 years before we're starting to recoup a little. But then if you look at this, we're really nailing it. Uh, on the way up, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. This is what we want. And this is where all the benefits like stormwater, for instance, and shade and health uh, to the community, uh, well-being, let's call it, uh, come from. So that's kind of what we need to focus on. We need to focus on getting our trees up in here. And in the reality, in a lot of urban sites, we're, we're stuck in a, in a closed loop down here, uh, back and forth. Grow it, replace it, grow it, replace it. So um, just kind of the, um, uh, come to a conclusion on this, it's very difficult to fix the past. You just keep throwing money at it, but it's a lot easier not to mess up the future and you're gonna reap the benefits from it. Okay. So why do we need to manage, manage green infrastructure better? Well, here's a list of a whole bunch of stuff that goes on. We're focused on uh, the urban forests, but uh, an interesting thing that's starting to power change is the increased insurance premiums or possibly in some neighborhoods of not getting any coverage because of flooding and also uh, litigation against municipalities and the government. So now there's some kind of political impetus uh, to follow through and uh, try and make change. Again, throwing money at the past, uh, it, it doesn't make a difference. So it's moving forward where we can uh, make some uh, change. Okay, so you've all seen this. Uh, engineers love big terms, they call it hydro modification. So it's basically the loss of impervious, or sorry, loss of pervious surface, which changes the hydrology model. So when you get rain, some of it infiltrates, some of it runs off, and some of it evapotranspires, which just means it evaporates directly off the plant or makes it into the ground and gets pulled back up through the plant and evaporated. 
it changes over time. And uh, this is the situation we have in highly urbanized areas where our runoff component uh, is significant and it comes at the expense of infiltration and evapotranspiration, or at least transpiration for sure. So this is a little dated, it's uh, City of Toronto, it's 2010. But the point I wanna make with this <clears throat> is not the actual area cover, it's just the consequences of change. So on the right, and side the red, black, and yellow, you'll see these are all uh, impervious services, buildings, roads, parking lots, other things. A little bit of water in there, but on the left side, the greens and the gray, these are the natural areas that we consider to be pervious. What happens as uh, the right side, the red expands into the green and the yellow expands into the gray, et cetera, is we have less uh, natural pervious surfaces, natural um, areas. What that means is it's not that we just have less, it just means in order to meet our needs, the performance of the natural components here has to increase. The natural uh, living area has to perform at a higher level to compensate uh, for the hard uh, surface area going in. So we've been here before. Uh, deforestation uh, caused many griefs. Um, in Ontario, uh, the, con the creation of the conservation authorities were because of uh, a number of these things. This is the city of London uh, in the late 30s experienced uh, uh, massive flooding, and uh, it was part of the impetus uh, for um, the conservation authorities in Ontario being created. <clears throat> Again, you see the, the similarities, uh, this picture on the bottom left there, that's City of Toronto, July 2013. So Edmunds Abbots and his associates, uh, uh, the folks that are responsible for reforestation, <clears throat> They understood this. They understood living green infrastructure uh, way over a century ago. And they took their model from India and other places where they've actually done this. Well, they knew if you could take a seriously degraded site and you can find uh, plants that could survive it. In this case, in Ontario, it was red pines, white pines sometimes, and, and some other trees. But if you planted them, over the seasons, the seedlings roots would uh, drop organic matter and the needles would drop and it would build that soil organic matter. And that would lead uh, to support of far greater microbial populations in the soil, which existed previously before deforestation. And then over time, uh, those, those organisms would develop better soil structure, which then would allow water holding and make more uh, nutrients available to the plants and it incrementally improved growing conditions for the next season. And so the cycle went on, and this is a cycle they understood, and it's been in place for uh, well over a hundred years. So things haven't really changed much. Uh, you've all seen this, so I'm not gonna spend much time on it other than make one comment. <clears throat> so uh, or soil organic matter, we have a very small percentage, which is actually living. And, and then we have fresh residue, which I call freshly dead. And then you have a larger percentage, which is decomposing um, organic matter. And, and they all have different characteristics. So I'm gonna call this uh, really dead. And then over here on the left, uh, humus, stabilized organic matter. I'm gonna call this very, very, very dead uh, plant and um, microbe and animal matter. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this is in a, a stable soil, and this is supposedly, I mean, these pie graphs were created uh, literally a century ago, so <clears throat> they're, they're, they're not anything to uh, take as gospel. But the interesting thing about humus, when you get it very stable like this, there's not a lot of nutrient availability here, but it really is good for soil structure. And an interesting thing about it is uh, we talk about nutrient holding in the soil, Specifically, we talk about cation exchange capacity. This has that, but it has an anion exchange capacity, the, the ability to tie up 
negative charge uh, nutrients. And uh, two of the ones that are a real challenge here in Ontario and elsewhere uh, from the urban environment and agriculture are nitrates and phosphates. They're the two that leach right out and get into the groundwater and our water courses and cause all the um, eutrophication, all the big uh, algae blooms and whatnot. If you had more of this in your soil, you'd have the ability to slow down, tie that up and make it plant available. Okay, so just speaking about nutrient holding capacity and again, cation exchange capacity, and don't get caught up on this. That the point here is, as far as soil nutrient holding, we all know that I recognize that clay soils have the ability to uh, hold uh, plant available nutrients to a large degree compared to uh, sandy soils. It's quite significant. Clay soils ha have their own issues as far as uh, water availability or drainage. But the important, uh, the important point here is go back to the humus and you'll see the humus is a magnitude of 10 or more better at nutrient holding. So in your soils, your organic matter is really important uh, as, into the, as far as the well-being of your, your plants. And again, your water holding, uh, this little top bar graph has been around forever. Um, Basically, it shows that at least up to uh, 6%. See, so if you go from 1% um, organic soil matter up to 6, there's almost, a, well, there is a direct linear um, increase in water holding. This is a very old thing. And uh, I remember an engineer asking me, uh, where'd you get that from? I said, I don't know. It's been around. You just go on the web and it's there. Then I found someone that actually did some research to see um, how relevant it was and uh, they checked the research and they came up with uh, even more astounding uh, numbers. So 1% uh, increasing uh, increase in organic matter up to uh, five or 6% anyways, it'll taper off uh, after that plateau. 25,000 gallons of available water uh, uh, per acre. So clearly a very significant. And this is at a lower compaction level down here. It's in the top uh, six inches of the soil, and it's at um, a, a reasonable, not super compacted level. So uh, a lot of numbers here wouldn't uh, worry too much about them, but again, we got the change in organic level here, one, two, three, four percent. We're just going to switch over here and look at carbon uh, storage here. You'll see that the numbers go up proportionally uh, in a very similar fashion. So organic matter is also your carbon storage in the soil. Now, you've also seen this, but the point I wanna uh, make about this, this slide is, um, or soils in general, is uh, a healthy soil and its function and uh, uh, nutrient available is biologically driven, but we don't generally measure uh, soil health biologically. We can't, it's more complex, and traditionally we don't do it, so we measure it in physical and chemical uh, uh, means and so it gives the um, it gives the impression uh, that our soil is a physical and chemical property uh, when in fact stuff like uh, the soil structure the water holding capacity the infiltration rates and the cation exchange the nutrient holding cation anion exchange capacity are all biologically driven but we just don't typically in development or agriculture measure it that way Okay, so from an urban forest perspective and a stormwater perspective, uh, trees do many, uh, serve many um, processes and in interception of water. They intercept it directly, they can evaporate it uh, back off uh, directly, they can infiltrate it into the ground following uh, the tree roots and uh, root hairs. And then once it's in the ground, they can pull it back up through the tree and plants, all plants do this and transpire it back into uh, the atmosphere. And this is what uh, happens when we have uh, large areas of vegetative cover, whether they be a grassland or, or a forest. So this really reduces our, our runoff, uh, which reduces the opportunity for contamination to ground uh, water and 
um, <clears throat> uh, say, aquatic hab habitat. So for trees to be able to do these things, they require, and this is all very simple, right? Uh, sufficient soil volume and soil quality to allow them to reach maturity. So we're coming back to the maturity thing. And the same uh, as benefits and requirements apply to turf and all other plants as well in the urban environment. There's no difference. And again, organic matter is a key uh, to all this functionality. Okay, so we know all this. And we have documents and uh, guidelines and research that would allow us to do better uh, development in these uh, newer areas. Um, this is uh, a document that's put out by the conservation authorities through a program called STEP, uh, Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program. There's fantastic uh, public access resources here that would apply, uh, uh, that would be useful to most areas of the country. This is all there. Uh, and again, low, pack, low impact development standards and planning. We have piles of stuff. So the trouble is, is just getting it implemented. The one on the left brings up uh, the idea of having a soil management plan. And all that means is you look at a site before you impact it with development and you determine what resources are there and how to manage them. Do you save the soil resources on site? Do you export them off site because it makes more sense from a quality point of view that you bring something in or do you amend what you have on site or what you bring in but you have a plan and do you deal with the subsoil uh, compaction are you looking at scarifying it and you lay it all out as if you actually had uh, um, <clears throat> you had uh, a design for say a roadbed where every step of developing that roadbed you would measure and confirm that each stage was done correctly before you moved on to the next. So this is a relatively new idea. Uh, it makes a significant difference to the overall landscape. It's not implemented very much because we're still in the point where we just like to compact everything overall so we can build a hard structure basically anywhere. <clears throat> so this simple uh, soil management plan where basically they recognize the outline of the building as needing support, so higher compaction levels, and the driveway. And there'll be areas uh, where you have utilities coming in that you're going to have to be careful. But there are areas that you can assure that the subsoil is, is scarified, for instance, so that it integrates well with your topsoil level. And the same with, say, in the backyard of this. And again, rec respecting uh, existing trees if they are there in their uh, root structures. Uh, so three meters within the building foundation, understandable. You need that compaction level and, and very low organic matter, uh, at least at a lower level. But this simple uh, uh, soil management plan is based on uh, 10 centimeters scarified uh, subsoil, which is not hard to do, and 30 centimeters, uh, so basically a foot of composted amended topsoil. You might have topsoil that's good that you don't have to do that, but very often you would. So now we have a 40 centimeter uh, total uncompacted depth. So this would make a significant difference to the plant health and also the stormwater management uh, of this site if it was implemented on a regular basis. Again, more numbers, I wouldn't get caught in, up in these too much, but uh, this is all about compaction and how it affects uh, reading systems. Engineers generally deal with what they call proctor density method. And again, when they develop a site, they try to compact to well over 90% proctor density. Proctor density, And all that means is compacting to uh, a theoretical 90% of what they possibly could compact it to. As far as roots go, uh, we start getting into root limiting uh, compactions at about 85%. Acceptable is 75 to 85, which means uh, plants, you can expect them to do okay. So in development, there is a sweet spot uh, because at 75%, you're gonna experience settling of uh, the ground area, which, which can be problematic. At 80, you're pushing it into uh, root limiting and 85, you're really at the top of root limiting. 
So we can actually set a standard as say 80 to 85, basically it's a compromise. And again, this is for development. You can change this over time with the management of your uh, landscape. But this is 80 to 85 would be a huge improvement versus over 90. And over 90, they usually mean like 95%. And that's what we're getting in new developments. And even in say uh, stormwater ponds and restoration sites. Another issue here in Ontario, uh, are probably similar in any kind of highly uh, developed area where you have a lot of uh, intensification and, and uh, infill going on is as we had hard infrastructure, we don't have room for the topsoil. And so we truck it away. We truck it away in dump trucks. So there's a big carbon footprint. Where do you take it? In Ontario, we got 25 million cubic uh, meters a year coming out of Southern Ontario. And typically we are just taking it to uh, older or existing uh, quarries and burying it in there. I'm wondering at some point years from now, we'll actually go back in and mine it out, but all the soil structure probably be gone and the benefits. So this is like a massive lost resource that's going on as a byproduct of development. So all this good topsoil, we're not in a position to use it, you know? And if you want to truck it away, where do you truck it? Because then the carbon footprint becomes pretty enormous. So there might be, say, in the greater Toronto area, there might be, um, I'm going to say between 500 and 1,000 dump trucks making multiple, uh, you know, six hauls out a day from uh, big projects uh, down there. And this is all a lost resource that actually took us 10,000 years uh, to create. So I'm going to finish up on this slide. And this is not unique to Ontario, but this is Ontario's take on it. We've, uh, we've accepted this, this new idea um, uh, where we're looking at uh, basically uh, mandating the initial first inch or a little bit more, 25 to 30 millimeters, depending on the geographical area of rainfall, has to be managed on the site. So this would apply to uh, new construction and also renovation and infill. So the first 25, 30 millimeters or an inch or a bit of rainfall, uh, that lands has to be infiltrated uh, and or held and release, you know, capture and release. So that would be say a rain garden, but infiltrate it could be your lawn. If you managed it well, your, your urban canopy cover. And there's many different uh, processes you could use. So the criteria type on the left, we have what's called volume retention reduction, we, and we have a bunch of other ones going down. But if you look at the blue circles, the blue circles being highly effective uh, at reducing peak flow, runoff, water quality, uh, maintaining water balance, reducing erosion, flood control, all these things. But this runoff volume reduction thing is, that's basically living green infrastructure. That's your urban uh, tree cover. That's your trees. Even if you have one tree on a turf, front lawn that's what they're talking about and it's the most effective of all these other management practices which would include uh, hard infrastructure stormwater management so you can see the value and even the government now is understanding it it's maybe a, a little late but we didn't understand the cumulative uh impact of urbanization we didn't have a way of measuring it we do now and then we throw uh weather extremes in on it and now uh even uh the government's recognizing the value of living green infrastructure so that's kind of uh, the cole's note version of development um uh, any questions on that uh, can certainly, this we can't do it right now, this is the second recording, but can certainly be addressed to me. I'd be happy to uh, uh, entertain them. And, um, and we're gonna move on from here into the next section, which is gonna look at the long-term maintenance of living green infrastructure. So <clears throat> what do you do when you get all this in place? You design this so that you have a functional system 
very often, even if we do, our, uh, our after maintenance degrades it over time and we lose the performance. And again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're in a spot now where we can't just accept the performance of our green infrastructure the way it was. We actually find, have to find ways of uh, improving that performance to compensate for what's going on. So that is uh, the end of part one, um, basically the history of living green infrastructure. And I apologize again if it's a little Ontario centric, uh, but I don't get out much. So thank you, thank you very much, Chris. That was um, a tremendous overview, and uh, you've set it up beautifully now, laying the context for understanding the next three parts, long-term maintenance, tree selection, and how trees go grow, and the implications of that in our maintenance practices. And um, you said people can contact you. What is your preferred email address for being contacted, Chris? Yeah, I didn't have a chance to slip that in there, but it's uh, uh, Chris at, and this is all one word, stormwater forestry. Dot .ca. Dot .ca. Chris yeah. at stormwaterforestry.ca. That's beautiful, Chris. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to meeting you next week when we continue this. Sounds and we'll good. have live Q&A. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Bye for now.